What's up, guys? This episode of the podcast is with Elliot Baev. I know, he's got a great first name, doesn't he? Um, Elliot is a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt and martial arts academy owner. Um, he also wrote a book, Sales Jiu-Jitsu, about um, how you combine, how sales and Jiu-Jitsu are so similar. Um, he is the first person to have uh, an only girls school in Canada with an only girls comp team, which I thought was a very interesting concept to start. And he's just an overall good dude with a lot of concepts and a lot of insight on uh, the business side of martial arts. So here we go. Without further ado, Elliot Baev. My brother with the same name as me, Elliot. What up, man? How you doing? Doing I'm great. Good. I'm good, man. How are you? Yeah, really good. Really good. So you have done my. We have we you have, we were a guest on my Gospel Fire podcast, and now we are over here in our business sense. We have our business suits on. And we are talking martial arts business. Mm -hmm. uh, you have recently released this book, Sales Jiu-Jitsu. You have a course that goes with it, right? Um, we have an online platform with a course. Uh, first of all, what made you go down this route of like helping other businesses? Uh, well, I've, uh, you know, I've been running my own school for better part of 15 years. And, uh, I was running a program. I mean, we, we know obviously the power of jujitsu to right. help anyone, but particularly business people, um, and entrepreneurs. And I started mastermind BJJ a few years back, which was like a private training group for entrepreneurs. And, uh, one of the participants, like we do a little private session in the morning and then we'd go for brunch and talk life and business. And one of the participants, uh, as I was teaching, you'd just see every once in a while, his ears would perk up and something would stick out. And as we started talking about it, the way I was teaching jiu-jitsu, a little bit more of that philosophical end, uh, was very much in line with how he teaches sales. He's a high-level sales guy, works for a company called Advance Your Reach. He's been uh, in sales for 25 years. He's got, um, uh, he's, you know, rate or earned through sales, you know, I don't want to misquote, but like tens and tens of millions, maybe even up uh, upwards of a hundred and he's taking his current company to eight figures. So um, as we got to talking, there were just so many parallels and then someone recommended, Hey, you guys should write a book. So uh, it came together that way. All right. Well, we'll get more into the book in a minute. And like the thing, let's talk about running the school. Um, what have how, why did you start teaching a school? What, what was part of the reasoning behind you doing that? Um, so my first school was actually a women only school. It was okay. called a girl. Um, it was I, maybe to this day, Canada's only women's Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Academy. Okay. Uh, part of the motivation for that was, I mean, the biggest part was, you know, we know the power of Jiu Jitsu generally and then for women from a women's self-defense perspective very you know very powerful there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh i also you know i was training a few different places i didn't want to compete with the the schools i was training at so i thought this was a kind of gentle way to kind of start my own thing without that and at the time like this was back 2004 and even though i think the ultimate fighter had started by then jiu-jitsu yep. still wasn't a household name and so Not quite right? The, the places that you could train, it was like a whole bunch of dudes in, you know, Speedos and Valley Tudor shorts, uh, no shirts. Like it wasn't really a welcoming environment for women. And even like when I first started Jiu-Jitsu, like 96-ish, the Gracies had a women's self-defense program. And even back then in high school, I was like, man, how do we get that? How do we get a program like that here? Nothing ever came together. But uh, that idea of like, make you know, here's this transcendental art this amazing art and it's just not taught in an environment where anyone's actually going to want to train it so the idea was to create more of a yoga studio type vibe where we still have high quality jiu-jitsu but it's going to be a place that's welcoming in that at that time for women and then my current school open mat uh started out of that so kept the same vibe but um obviously open to everyone why just women to start? Uh, from all those reasons, like women's self-defense, it was 
I, you know, I think you probably agree. It's the best martial art from women's self-defense perspective. It allowed me to not have, you know, I, there were basically no women. There was like maybe one woman in my academy at the time um, or in probably like five in all of Toronto. And it just, it was like, man, there's nowhere good for women to train. So uh, created that space. And then, uh, and again, didn't want, you know, was, uh, didn't, was apprehensive to like be competing with the schools that I was training at. So it seemed like a happy marriage and started like renting space once a week from a yoga studio and then went to twice a week at a different studio and just kind of grew from there. So I think when you and I had talked, I had uh, one very serious female competitor in, um, and one and another female competitor that was basically just helping my one competitor. And, but you know, they were two of my closest athletes. And now I have this female fighter who, God, I almost want to say, I almost enjoy women more teaching them. Um, it's been a very like? interesting, what's that? What do you like about it? Uh, the trust is there. Mm. There's no, uh, there's no ego that gets in the way, mm. right? We don't have to do this thing where, and I was, t I actually I talked to my therapist about this. So this is one of the things, I mean, like, look, so I do love this piece as well. Um, I do love showing people like, and we, I can't do it right now. So this bothers me. Like when somebody comes in, when a dude comes into school and they're like a purple belt and they just moved here, you're like, you're going to teach the class, but then you're going to show them, you know, what's up to, right. Mm -hmm. That has never existed with the girls, right. There, there, this piece of like, I need to, sh like, I need to prove myself to you in a way by beating you. It's non-existent. Mm -hmm. And it all comes down to if you can make them more skillful mm -hmm. and if you can make them more skillful, then they're in, right? Mm -hmm. It's all about the relationship. It has nothing to do with the ego and the ego is on my side too. I, I won't with the men, I won't say it's not, but the, with the girls, it, the women, it's, it's just not there. Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't know. I enjoy it. Yeah, like I enjoy it a lot. Mm -hmm. And, like, uh, I have some true love. Like I really love them and it's super, like they're my children, like they're my kids. Right. And even like, I was, I was totally talking to my therapist about this today. It's funny. Like the way I touch them, like I put my hand on their head and I don't touch my wife like that. Right. Like I touch my wife, like even, even in gestures, right. Like I'm not talking sexually, right. Like I, I touch them more. Like I touch my children, like I am here to, I, I'm part of this journey with you. I, I'm going to hopefully make you better, right? And more skillful. One of the rewarding things for a teacher in general is see your students grow. And then yeah. male or female, when you see someone who maybe came in not so confident and you see them grow and you see them get confident, it's like that much more rewarding. And then maybe on average, you're going to see uh, women who enter the, the step on the mat maybe, you know, on average, less confident in their physical prowess. And then to see that transformation is just super rewarding. And uh, maybe that's what it is. There's that, that, that is like women haven't in, in tra traditionally haven't been taught that they can be badasses and physical prowesses. And if you can be a part of making them that it's really fucking cool. Oh, that's so, uh, what I didn't mention, uh, is through kimono girl, uh, which ran for like from 2004 to 2008 or nine, we would every other month or so we would run free women's self-defense workshops. And okay. so we ended up running over 50 and for on, on the whole over a thousand women and just to see, you know, for a lot. So that was all like, it was always basically newbies who were stepping in there and to see like, even the first time you show like UPA or trap and roll mount escape, like, right, right someone who's never felt physically powerful or that they were capable of being powerful. That's like, and that's the beauty of jujitsu. It's not like do this, 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 and you're just kind of believing the instructor without feeling it. Jiu-jitsu, you feel like, wow, that, that was a heavy person. I got them off of me with no effort. 
and just that that look in their eyes, the the excitement and the the empowerment, and for lack of a better word, is so inspiring because we know that the empowerment we get on the mats bleeds everywhere into life. Right. And, you know, and so having run so many workshops and then with my, another program I started in 2013, fight like a girl. Um, we ran another 50 for since then over a thousand women as well. You just see, uh, this, this, yeah, like even, even in one class, a transformation, because even though, of course, one class, you don't pick up real skill that like is going to stay with you forever. What you do is you open your mind and that you can see their minds open to a potential. And then, so we talk about this a lot. And so in these workshops, so how do we train women and girls in our society to be, to see themselves as fierce and powerful and to speak up or to be sheepish and quiet and to not kind of impose, right? It's definitely the former. And so oh, yeah. for them to get uh, a taste of feeling powerful, like we don't look at a female lion and be like, oh, it's a female lion. It's like, no, no, no. It's that's, a lion. A, that's a lion, right? And like that's people of any gender or sex are, you know, are can be dangerous if they have the right mindset and optimally some training, right? But if they don't believe they can be, then, you know, one thing I really love that Henner Gracie says is, uh, and I, I would say this in different forms, like the foundation of being able to defend yourself is feeling like you're worth defending. And I think that's so on point because how much in our society do we, you know, devalue people in general and, and don't, you know, don't necessarily breed a high sense of self-esteem in anyone, but then women more particularly where your, your value is just about your looks or looks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and then, you know, we've had, I've had women who have told me like, uh, you know, I never liked my body. I never valued my body and jujitsu has given me that for the first time. And it's like that, you know, one of the things I think probably, you know, you're, you're definitely a more tapped in guy than just, you know, you are a fighter very much, but you also care about personal growth. So to, those are some of the most rewarding things you can get. Like, yeah, it's cool to have champion competitors, but to see someone like someone's life change because their perspective on themselves changed, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's so much of what I get out of these things. On a personal level, it's what I get because I don't really take much credit for the champion. Like if you're like, come on, man, what Jones was John Jones? What gym was John Jones going to walk into and be a champion at? Any single one. Yeah. Right. Like, all right, you you choose the one. Look at that fucking dude. You, you know, GSP. You choose the one. You know, as long as it's decent, it's going to be okay. Great perspective. Right. It's going to be okay. But like, if you can take a not confident person and make them confident, that's not anybody, mm -hmm. right? That's not any gym. That's not any instructor. That's not, that's the relationship that you have to build with that person to have them. Uh, my, you know, I met with one of my coaches a couple of weeks ago and he said, uh, the best performance enhancing drug of all time is confidence. And if you can give and build confidence in somebody, then man, and that's what that's what's the best part for the schools about me, you know, yeah. you know, male, female, child doesn't doesn't matter, right? It's it's that confidence, and that's why I'm sure your school is very similar. That's why I built the culture of open mat the way I have. Right, where it's like yeah, we have a you know a very very strong competition team and and all that, but it's a place where you anyone can come in. And feel welcome and feel like there's something for them to learn and there's a place for them. Whereas very often, you know, high caliber competition schools, maybe it's feel only that it's only that. And, and maybe, you know, they have their the reasons for that. Maybe they feel like if it's not, you know, iron sharpens iron, then we're going to get weak. So we have to have that culture. And, you know, I, I, I just disagree. I think you can have both and you just have to kind of be thoughtful about how, you integrate you those both. Ones. Yeah. Yeah. It was super interesting because, uh, you know, um, we've started, we've launched Easton online now as you know, and, uh, I'm doing some consulting. Like I get on the phone with people after they buy the course or before they buy the course, whatever. And everyone has these questions, 
right? Like these very specific questions, you know, sales or blah, blah, like who, who knows, right? Curriculum. And I can't get by core values and culture. I'm like, their, their systems questions fall back to they have no culture established, uh, like a real, like that everyone knows, like, which means they have no core values, like what you will lose friends and money over. That's what we call core value in the school where it's very obvious. Like we, we run the school based on these, on these values, just like you do your life, right? You run your life based on values mm -hmm. and um, you can't act outside your values. You, you just, you can't, right? Like if you do, then it's just not a value. So uh, everyone, and that's where I haven't gotten past core values with anybody yet. One person, one person we're talking curriculum now, finally, but it's been three months. Mm -hmm. Right. It's been three months. Um, well, you know, and that's where it's so, I think probably so great for your, I don't know if you call them clients or, but the school owners who are working with you to have you because it's the exact same transformation, right? Like, um, recognizing that, you know, as a school owner, you probably have the tools you need, but maybe you haven't articulated what your philosophy and what those values are. And so having guidance on that, and, you know, and from someone who's done it successfully allows you to have a strong baseline from which you can then improve systems, focus on curriculum. And it's natural for a school owner to focus on kind of the, the surface and not the substance. Right. But yeah, to have that guidance to push back to like culture first, because ultimately a, a school is a culture right. kind of above anything else. Right. A community and a culture. Right. That's, that's why people stay in our opinion. They, they might think they're coming for jujitsu or in our case, jujitsu or Muay Thai, but that's not why, that's not why anybody stays. Nobody stays because like, yeah, the martial arts are cool, but the martial arts are cool at anybody's school. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, I mean, am I teaching better than, uh, you know, Leo Zinu? No, probably not. He's, you know, but things are different. Right? There's there's different things about it. That's not why anybody's really there. Well, that's like that's why people kind of self-select your school over another school, you know. Right. And at the beginning, people even if you had the best instruction in the world, people who are coming in for the first time, they they don't know how to evaluate based on that. But everyone knows how they feel in a space, you know, and mm. how safe they feel. You know, I've, I've had people talk about, um, you know, coming from environments where like senior people would like look at them cross-eyed or deval, you know, you're not, you're not valuable because you're a white belt or you're brand new, like, and there's this hierarchy and there is a natural and I think even healthy hierarchy that evolves in schools. But, you know, and they, they say, I think maybe Dostoevsky or someone said, like, you tell a lot of, about a nation by how it treats its, its prisoners we can learn a lot about a school by how it teach, treats its new people. Right. You know? Yeah, it's, it's so true. When did you move from the women's only to what Open Mat is now? Uh, well, Open Mat started in 2008. I was renting space from one of the big box gyms, like putting down folding mats, picking them up, cleaning them every night. Um, and then the, just the demand, you know, I, I've been – in it for a long time. So I had a bit of a name. So there was just like a lot more, a lot of interest in me teaching co-ed classes. We had a really good location. So, uh, it, I, there was no intention to like stop the women's stuff. But then as soon as open mat started, there was just like all the, those classes kind of flooded. And, um, and what was interesting is at the beginning, because who were the senior students? It was women. So women. the only guys that actually came in and stuck around were those that didn't have a big ego because they were getting beat up by women. Right. And so that very much was a, a good bedrock for the culture where it's like, you know, and of course, like as, as you would do if someone, you know, is getting on a hand, like, yeah, we'll train with them and we'll, we'll show them what's up. Um, but it, it, there was a self selector like that, that there was this culture of, uh, just positive vibes, we'll say, right. Where everyone's respected and that, that just very much, uh, helped define the culture that Obmat uh, has and has 
started with and, and still has. So when did when did men come? How, what, what was that? What year do you think that was? Two thousand eight. Okay, got yeah. it. So two thousand eight. So you've had a mutual uh, for a good amount of time now. Yeah, co-ed school for thirteen oh, yeah. years. Yeah. 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 What has been? Uh, what was the most difficult part of like? Was there push? Was there pushback from the ladies? Like when? Um, not, when it wasn't going to be just about okay. At the because we still kept the women only classes and times and then okay. Uh, there was more like, you know, and this, this is something that happens, uh, you know, with women's classes, like any co-ed classes, like more when like prices would raise or locations change, like those are more the disruptive things mm-hmm. that like offering, you know, because, you know, I tried to do a good job of monitoring who came in and when the wrong energy came in and people couldn't kind of fit then they, you know, they, they weren't welcome back in, in whatever form that means. Right. So you let them weed themselves out a little bit, right? Yeah. And you know, and then there's, there's the odd time I'm sure you've had to deal with it where you have to weed them out. And, but most of the time it's, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I know what you're talking about. I I can, (laughs) I'll tell a quick story. I mean, about a year ago, I, uh, you know, whenever I roll with somebody and let them that has experience, you know, you be, I beat them a little, not badly, you know, but just, you know, make sure they know. And then I let them beat me. Like, I want to see how they handle tapping somebody. I think it's very important. Like, it's not just because, you know, and so I'm laying on my side and I give the guy my arm and I had to scream oh. tap before he broke my arm. And then he gets up and he's like, what's up? You can't handle this. And I was like, (laughs) and then we just fought like right there on the fucking mat. And then after I beat his ass, I was like, now get the fuck out. Like, like, so, I mean, I can't say it was my proudest moment, but like, Uh, uh, you know, we, yes, that was a weed out moment. (laughs) Like you're, uh, you're not coming here. Um, and then I called him the next day and, you know, we worked it out, but he's like, he couldn't come, but like, you know, but in, you know, fuck. So yeah, sometimes you have to weed them out still. And it's very rare. It's very rare, but it happens. Yeah. And you know, your students are lucky, not that just that you're at the level you are, but that you were willing to do that because better that happens with you than with one of them. And they get, you know, burnt, you know, turned off and never train again. Maybe they were the next Marcelo Garcia. Yeah. And look, this was, I mean, this was like a 200 pound dude, like my, like, you know, near my size. So, I mean, if it was one of my 130 pound, 150 pound people's arms, it would have gone off, right? Like it would have just been torn off. Like I'm big enough that I could handle his craziness. Mm-hmm. So um, there's a lot of responsibility. I like, I feel that the instructor holds a lot of responsibility to the student. Like this idea, tell me how you feel about this, this idea that the student needs to be loyal to you as the instructor. Like, I understand that, but I feel it goes more the other way. Like it is, it is my job to make sure that in every way I make you feel safe. I make you feel uh, connected and that it's my privilege that you're showing up for any class that I would ever teach, regardless of how, good of a teacher I am uh you know for anyone listening I'd say like think about what you Elliot just said like think of what that says about the culture you've created and the way I think of it is like what you're talking about people who think that the students have to be loyal to you that's one sense of the word master like I'm the master I'm above you right but the root the real meaning of master is I'm you're my charge. You're my ward. I'm here to take care of you, not that I'm above you. And that for me is like, and you know, there's a lot of bad stuff from traditional martial arts that it's good that modern martial arts doesn't have. Mm-hmm. But some ideas like that, I think are actually really valuable. And and you got to find a balance, right? It's not about being like, you know, some martyr and never, you know, not taking any payments and just do, you know, living a, a life for your students exclusively. But I think there's something high integrity and really admirable and noble about that other approach. And it bleeds into the culture. 
it's and you, both and right. It, like, why do I don't know why we have to have this either or thing that goes on so much, right? Like, if they both and like, yes, I am in charge, and yes, uh, I am in charge of you, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's it's not it's not one or. Mm-hmm. Well, you're you're the you're the caretaker. You have to right. take. That's that's our job. You know, I always like to say, I, I don't like people like nobody pays me for jujitsu classes. Like nobody, uh, you pay for the life change, like mm-hmm. the, how, like the, the, the skilled life change that you will go on is, is why you are paying tuition. Jiu-jitsu is free. Muay Thai is free. Yeah. And you know, the, where I think that has legs is you're not just teaching bullshit like you're oh, teaching right. legit stuff that will actually raise confidence if someone actually needs to defend themselves it will work i right. think where traditional martial arts sometimes fell into a trap is they'd have that but the stuff wasn't battle tested it wasn't right. stuff that we know is high percentage or actually works and so it then creates this cult of like well the master's really nice but do you feel confident does this stuff would you would it work Right. You know, lose sight of that. So I think it's that balance between practical and personal or philosophical almost. I I totally understand the, especially what year did you start Jiu Jitsu? Mm, 96, I think. Yeah. So I understand in the 90s and late 90s when most Americans were starting it, um, the big move away from traditional martial arts because traditional martial arts and in their in that current form got a little poisonous, right? Like this cultish, uh, mat. Like I mean, I can remember going out to dinner with like when when because I did traditional martial arts since I was six years old, and when, you know if we were at a tournament and then we would go out to dinner, and then you know you'd all order food and my food would come, but the master's food hadn't come yet. I I wasn't allowed to eat. Right. Right. Like, like my food had to sit there and get cold and it's just like that, that's too much. Right. That that's, that's, that's too much. Or I I mean, and even for me as a 16 year old, I was the highest ranking student at the school for most, almost every single day. And every time I would walk on and off the training floor, the whole school would have to stop and acknowledge but, right. And it's just, yeah, man, right. It's just too much. So I understand the, the push away from that, mm-hmm. but I understand the move back towards it a little bit as well. Right. Well, the move, yeah. Balance, right. It's that yeah. pendulum pendulum sometimes swings too far this way. Then it goes back and still a little too far, but a little better. And then eventually we find like, what do all most spiritual practice talk about practices the middle way, right. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like, and, and, and in this day and age, especially like social media and algorithms and all that, like everything's so polarized, it's either, or I really like what you said, both and right. It's like, right. how do we find something that harmonizes the, the good things from both? And that's for me, the, the like spirit of jujitsu, take what works, yes. but leave out what, what's no good. That's all. And, and that's, I think jujitsu does that so well in itself because and, and I would say Muay Thai as well, because it, they, you actually have to practice them, right? You're going to make the contacts. Like, I'm going to see if this works. Where, um, it, So it, it leaves the trash behind, but you have to leave it, right? You have to leave it. Um, some other questions here. If you could go back, right, and give yourself some advice here as a new school owner that you didn't know then that you do know now. <laughs> How long do you have? <laughs> um, we've got about 20 more minutes on the show. So, and go. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, well, um, the, probably the biggest thing is I would find someone like you, you know, it was, I was kind of spinning my wheels for the first four or five years before I, it even occurred to me that I should try to learn from a more successful school. And, you know, like that's like training with your buddy in a basement thinking, Oh, I'm putting in the work. I'm, I'm training hard and never having an instructor. It's like running a school is a jujitsu. It is a skill that can be grown and developed and in a sense mastered where it's like, you know, yes, we're always developing our skills further. And yes, my, you know, my escape from this position that could grow, 
But at a certain point, you kind of have the trap and roll good enough. At a certain point in running your school, you kind of have attendance or whatever it is good enough. It's not that uh, you can't grow beyond a certain point and, and trying to learn or trying to train without an instructor, it's just, you know, beating your head against the wall. It's like we find people who know what we don't know, who are more, who are further along than us and want to share that what they know. Right. I thank you for the plug, you know, the shame, you know, but just so that just so everyone else knows, I, I mean, you do it too with your life and I do it too with my life, right? Like this, this idea of growth, this idea of, of improvement. I have people that I'm look like, you know, I'm always searching this, this, I'm always searching for people to be like, yo, I got to do, I, I want to, not that I want to be like that guy, but like, okay, he does this really, really well. Let's go. Let me, let me learn. Let me, let me figure this out from him. Well, that's you know? tough, right? like to, you know, you can try to copy from the outside without kind of being willing to be a, be a, you know, put on your white belt. Right. And where, where are you going to learn faster when someone has that info to share? And, you know, that wasn't like a, that wasn't meant to be just a plug for you. It's right. Find someone who, and that could be a buddy who also has a school who's been around a little longer, like more than that. But, you know, what I, the problem with a uh, relationship like that is because it's informal there and there aren't clear boundaries. Like you can't call anytime and ask any question you want, but when it is like, you know, my student, like someone who trained with me once, well, it's probably a bad analogy because I'll answer questions for anyone, but like, right. So when, when they, someone has decided to work with you, they know they have kind of carte blanche access to your, to your knowledge, hopefully. Right. If, if I think if you're doing your job well and you know, there are people that would run their organization where like, okay, I'm only going to share information uh, to a certain point. And, and, you know, and there's value to that because you can't take so much in at once, but that would be the number one thing I would say, like finding someone who can teach you because, you know, a good mechanic doesn't necessarily run a good mechanic company, whatever that, you know, Shop. a good practitioner doesn't necessarily run a good school. Right. But how did they become a good practitioner? By finding someone who had the knowledge they want. They got a teacher. Yeah. Right. They got, you got, they got, they, nobody learned jujitsu on their own. They got a teacher and they learned jujitsu. We, uh, we didn't learn this business aspect of it on our own. Mm -hmm. Right got a teacher and you learned how to do business yeah and it like you know? i grew more in the first few months of that than i had in the previous four or five years you know right right like, because of, like even just one idea can change your whole business right so for, for us it was core values i mean i'll tell you what it was it was core values we will we were able to expand and grow so much because of the idea of setting core values because it put everyone on the same page so I'm curious then how, how did it get everyone on the same page? Like, was it that you decided then communicated it first to the staff and then students? Students don't even know what they are. Hmm. Students don't even know what they are and they, they don't like hang on the wall or anything like that. Right. Like we just communicated it, but it's not communicated. I was talking, uh, we have, you know, Mike, our CEO, he, we were talking yesterday. Uh, it's like doing self-help reading and not knowing, not actually doing the self-help right? Once you establish core values, you then have to live by them. Like mm -hmm. you have to implement them. If you say this is what you live for. Uh, and, I, and I just told this story on, on my personal podcast. I have a friend, Jay, who uh, I've never watched somebody live by their values more than, than Jay, you know? Um, he, and not that he, not that I even agree with the values, but uh, I, I do in his sense, because they're all pointed at me, um, but like he, he has this thing. It's called, he calls it his fuck you list and his guest list. And if you're his homie, if somebody's on my fuck you list, then they're on his fuck you list. Does, does not even care that I'm wrong. Doesn't care. He just holds his friends and loyal to his friends that much. That it is such a value. And I'm not saying he's right or wrong. But he also has a guest list where if I say, yo, Jay, this person's coming to dinner with us, regardless of whether or not he likes them or not, it's that he, he they're, they're good. 
it sounds like it's integrity. Right. For him. He's consistent. Yeah. yeah you might not yeah. agree with his approach, but he's integrous. He's, right. he's united. And it never changes. Right. It never changes. Like I could die and my wife will, be, my wife will always be good. And my kids who he's probably met one time, right. Because he's across the country now they're, they're on the list. And the question is, how does that make you feel about him? I, I mean, what, what does he need? What does he need whenever he needs it? And you know, mm-hmm. okay. And that's it. When someone yeah. lives their values, it, it irradiates and it attracts. Right. Right. And so that, I mean, I get, yeah. So I guess for us with the core values, once we, once we stated them, we had to implement them. And then how do you implement them? I have to do it. Amal has to do it. Mike has to do it. The GMs have to do it. Right. You, and we had to start holding each other accountable to living by the values and not that we don't slip up. Of course you slip up. Right. It's not like you get kicked out. Right. <laughs> like, you know, you have we all slip up. To back to, you have something to go and be like, ah, was you have, you have a litmus test. Was this in line with the values? Yes. No. Right. Yes. Okay. More. No. Okay. Adjust. You know, and, and this for us, that's when it really changed. You know, that's that's when it really changed. And that that for me is jujitsu, right? The gentle right. art of adaptability. You have to adapt to what's your ultimate goal to win. How do you define that? Okay. In this case, values because it's about the life you want to lead. And so the other kind of piece of advice I'd give to school owners that's become a lot more uh, close to home for me is like really sit with who you want to be in and outside of the school. Like I really let for a long time, over a decade, I'd say I let the identity of being a school owner just envelop me. And I like lost touch with my old friends and it made me very serious. And I I think we have to be conscious of like our bigger picture outside of the school and where that fits in because, because it's such a wonderful place where you're meeting and helping so many wonderful people it's easy to let it envelop all of you. And then maybe you're not paying enough attention to the other parts of your life. So it's a great point. Those, but those both in mind for me is, is huge. It's a great point. You know, we, uh, yeah, it's, it's an amazing point right there. Um, let's talk about sales jujitsu, the book a little bit itself. Like, uh, talk, tell me, I, you know, uh, my, my wife put it up here, you know, like probably good, for me, but then I, I just didn't see it, you know, when you sent it out to me. So tell me, t- I, so I haven't opened it too much yet. Tell me about sales jujitsu. What, what is it that it does? So it uses a, unlike, you know, you would think a jujitsu book, it's going to talk about leverage and balance and, and principles we learn on the mats rather than take that approach. We more use a jujitsu competition as an analogy for a sales engagement. And I created what I call the jiu-jitsu success formula. I've got, uh, I can, if I can share my screen, I can show you, but um, I might be able to. Hold on. I just have to give you permission. All right. So it's basically a four phase process. I'll wait till. One sec. More. Uh, Okay. You're the host. Sweet. Um, So it's a four phase process for prepping for, fighting in, winning, and learning from a jiu jitsu competition. And then we we apply that formula to sales. So within each section in pre fight, it's like what's the prep work you do before an engagement? Fight is how do you show up? How do you connect with a prospect? How do you spot openings and then position yourself within the engagement? Then winning, how do you move towards closing the deal? And then after the sale, after a win or loss, what's your postmortem process? And so you can see there's subsections like pre-fight. Number one's your inner game, right? We know, I mean, you must have done so much sports psychology for your UFC career and, and everything before that. So it's like, if that's not on point, how are you going to be successful? Then it's there's all, it all, it's all gone. If that's not on point. Right. Then that's, that's why that's the number one. Right. Then it's like, what do you know about your field? Right. What do you know about the history of jujitsu? For example, what we talk about in the book is 
I forget uh, where I got this, but like years ago, maybe 2008 or nine came out that like someone did statistics and most of the victors of jujitsu competitions at the worlds were the person who pulled guard. That's, Mm. that's really valuable information to know, even if you don't want to pull guard, then because you might, you know, say, I don't want to pull guard. I have to know that my opponent's probably going to pull guard. So I have to be intercept that if I want to play takedowns, it has to be long distance takedowns before they can pull or pat pull counters. Then I have to know about stuff that's coming up. Like Barambolo was beating, you know, blue belts were beating black belts because they just didn't know about this new trend. Uh, and then maybe you see, you see a specific opponent that you're going to fight. You see them earlier that day. Wow. That guy's got a really good arm bar game. I got to stay away from that. Then, you know, once you understand your field, you build a strategy, so you develop a game plan. But one of the things, uh, and this really stuck out to my my uh, co-author, Daniel, um, Daniel Moskowitz. Uh, what separates Brazilian jiu-jitsu from Japanese jiu-jitsu? The ground positioning for the most part, right? Like the, yeah, the strategy the on how to get to the position, the submissions. Yeah, but it's also how we train. In a lot of martial arts, there will be the same technique, but it's basically a compliant opponent, a compliant training partner. In jiu-jitsu, we train against real resistance. Live, sure. And and so what he was finding in a sales context is he was doing role-playing. He would have his teams do role-playing, but they'd be basically reading from a script. And it just didn't get any results. They felt like they were wasting their time. But then understanding this idea of a live training, he started... Every time a sale won or lost, he would take down all the objections and have them basically become what he calls sparring partners in their role play. And they would actually be trying to challenge each other in the role play. And that just grew their skill at thinking on the fly, adapting, having more experience with more challenges. And then, you know, when we train, problems will come up. I have this game plan. I'm going to pull and sweep this way. Sometimes that works doesn't. When it doesn't, well, we get more information than we then have to troubleshoot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Once you get into the fight, and stop me at any point if you have things you wanted to say. Or no, let's go. It's let's very go. interesting. Yeah, so I think, you know, in this, so at one of the Mastermind BJJ retreats we did at a cottage, we presented this, and a friend of mine who, who runs a big uh, cocktail company in the States was saying, like, this is a formula for facing any challenge. And that I was on Stefan Kesting's podcast last week. And, you know, one thing I, I shared with him is like, for me, jiu-jitsu is not the art of fighting. It's the art of facing challenges. Because the, the things that we experience on the mats apply to any challenge. And so here, you know, and, and so it's just, it's very universal stuff. We just happen to apply it to something that matters a lot in business, which is sales, kind of the foundation of keeping any business alive. So like you enter the fight, how do you connect? Do you, do you let the opponent dictate? Like, you know, initially in early in my competition career, I'd go in and I just kind of feel it out and, and decide, you know, try to adapt to whatever the opponent was doing as opposed to, you know, this idea of connect on your terms. Like I had a student who his game plan was to, get specific grips. He was a white belt. Like this was 10, 15 years ago. And the opponent kept getting grip and he, his plan was, okay, I'm just going to break his grips until I can get my grips. And he did this for like two, three minutes. And you could see the opponent just like basically give up because he was staying stubbornly behind the idea that we're not going to fight your game. We're going to fight my game. My so game. yeah, we're going to connect on my terms. Right. And it's like, say the opponent pulls guard and pulls you into a really intricate spider guard where you're really, don't try to pass, disengage, don't fight their game, connect on your terms. So how you connect, how you actually start the fight matters. And then you're going to try an opening gambit. You're going to try, you know, you get your grips, you try a foot sweep, either it works or it doesn't, but either way you generate a response. So I'll zoom in a bit. Um, And then, once you say it does work, well, there's a new opportunity. I, I took them down. Now there's an opportunity to start passing. I didn't take them down. They stepped out of it. Okay, the other leg is forward now. 
what's the opening? And then how do I rush to not rush, but how do I quickly fill that gap of that opening that's available? Then once you get, you know, what's the biggest white belt mistake uh, in a tournament, they get to side mount. And before they've got their points, they try to mount. They try to mount. Yeah. Yeah. They haven't secured their position. Once you get a good position, your first job is just to keep it. Make sure you don't get pushed back at all. And that might be so in a uh, in a sales context, um, you you know you you've gotten far along, you've got a good rapport with the the prospect, uh, and you you have a sense that your product can solve their their need. Instead of trying to jump to the close, like jumping on an armbar before it's really there, try to make sure you really understand. Ask more questions. Make sure you really understand that problem on a deeper level, that really secures your position. Then we work to improve our position. You're in side mount. That could mean jump. That could mean working to mount. That could mean just killing their arms. Right, so your right. mount is better. And let's then, do one. Let, let's do one. Let's, I, I, I want to hear your process. Uh, let's exit the screen. How do we, yep, there we go. Uh, let, I, I want to go through this because I'm so interested to hear somebody else who's skillful at this. Uh, get it done. How do I make me reclaim host? There we go. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited because we, yeah, we have a very similar process. I don't, we don't word it like that, but let's do it. I just took a class. Talk to me, make, sell me. Is that how you do it? Do you do it after class? Say again, do you do it after they take like a class or something when you make the, oh, how would I do this in a, in a school context? Yeah. Um, yeah. So like you could do it at any stage, right. But say, right. So, so say someone had a great class, right? Me, and Elliot, then, my man, my class was amazing. You had a great class. We're sitting down for our enrollment conference yep. right after. Now, I know you had a great class, so I could try to jump to, hey, here's the form, sign up. But if I haven't done the work, like to find out, hey, Elliot, so you had a good time? Yes. And I'll get you. Yes. Okay. So now you've just, re I've improved my position just by getting you to say yes. Right. But so, so what was it that originally got you here? You uh, you know, I saw the UFC and, uh, you, you know, man, like I, I saw, I just saw, I saw this really cool ch choke where this, this dude who just looked like he was like, you see that curly haired guy in the UFC? Like, and, and the other dude was just like, he, like that dude was just so skinny and, and, and there was a ripped dude and, and the skinny dorky looking kid like, like won. So the, the simple, the, the common mistake here would be like, ah, he's interested in MMA. So I'm going to jump to the close. Okay. We got a great MMA program right now. Sign up as opposed to what was it that you liked about that? Was it the idea that you liked the idea that you could defend yourself against someone bigger or yeah, was, was it? The it idea was, that you yeah. It was like the karate off? kid. It was like the karate kid, right? Like he, like this little skinny dude overcame and like, uh, you know, I don't look like a little skinny dude, but like I've been bullied my whole life and I know it doesn't make sense, but like, yeah. Okay. So I just learned a lot more about you, which puts me in better position to then improve my position by saying, yeah, you know, either I've had that same experience or we've got this student, Johnny, who came in was the shyest guy, you know, had dealt with bullying himself his whole life. And after three months, six months, eight months, entered his first tournament. And he said that that changed his life. He like within two months, he got a new job. He ended up meeting the woman of his dreams because he had the confidence to, et cetera, et cetera. But because I know more about you, I understand the situation better. I can actually, you know, what is jiu-jitsu? It's, it's fitting gaps. Right. I can fit the gap that I now better understand is there. It's all what it sounds like. And, and we're, all right, we do the same. It's all comes down to this communication piece, this building rapport and communication piece. Don't I say this to my students when I train, like uh, when I train with people, I don't try to submit early. It's not my thing. Um, I'm not very strong. I'm not like, you know, okay, I'm strong compared to like, you know, but compared to other big guys, I'm not the strongest. I'm not the fastest. I'm not the. Right. So I try to make you go because <gasps> once I hear that, right, once I hear you take that deep breath, I know you're getting tired. 
and I'm just going to keep getting you more and more tired. I'm just going to stay a little step ahead of you, right? I'm just going to play this game with you until you're done, right? And it's the same thing like when you're, you know, you're, when you're selling with somebody, when you're trying to, like, you, you have to get to a point where, like you said, you're staying ahead a little bit. Mm-hmm. right? Like I'm a little ahead. Just, just don't rush to, don't rush to the end. Don't rush to the finish, right? Don't rush. If you know, just let it be, let, 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 let it cook, let it simmer. The whole secret to jitsu is positioning, right? So the, you know, the idea is to position yourself so well that losing is impossible and winning is inevitable. Right. You know, when you've done a really good job, like, the submission you almost don't have to work for because it's just, it happens to be available because you've say ridden so high in the mount that the person has nowhere to keep their arms. And so the last step before we get into that winning phase is set up your win. So what does that mean? How do you, okay. So Elliot, imagine everything you felt today on the mats is really what you're going to experience every time. And imagine what I described of our student, Johnny, is the experience you have. So six months from now, how, how do you think you will be different? How, what will be the change in your life and what will that mean to you? If I can get you to tell me that, then that's very effectively, I would say, set up the win because you're seeing the value of the close. Right. And what, and more, Elliot, seeing what you could be, well, where would you be in six months if you never trained? What's the cost? So, my, my partner in sales terms uses the cost of inaction. Yeah. What's the cost going to be if you, ne- you know, you've been thinking about this for how long? How many years? In six months, how are you going to look back on this on today if you don't sign up and you don't take that first step? Are you going to be proud that you waited another six months? And so these kinds of um, kind of following the scenarios. Problem, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So those are some examples. And then, you know, uh, we can go as deep as. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah that- no, we, yeah. We're, nobody. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, man, I just want to say uh, this is super important to me to hear other people's perspectives even though like, you know, you have your thing and I have my thing. It's what we talked about. Uh, I think at the beginning of the podcast is there's not this, like, it, it can be both and right. Like I don't, we don't do it exactly like you. Our course isn't, you know, it's not set up with that, with the fight thing. Right. And it doesn't like, you know, but I just got a little couple pieces, mm-hmm. you know, and it's just, it's one of these things where they both can exist. And like, so rarely do I think that you would come on my podcast knowing that I'm selling like that, that we offer help for people. And I would even then have you on my podcast because you have your thing. It just doesn't scare me. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I think you're the same, right? It doesn't scare me. I'm not competing against you, right. To you sell yours and I sell mine We're we're in this game together. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't hurt me when you're more successful. Right. You know, yeah. In fact, in fact, the opposite, right. Right. The, you want, you want to be both, you know, uh, connected to people who are more successful and you want to be pushed by someone kind of pushing Coming it up. up. Yeah. Yeah. That, that forces you to work harder. Coke needs Pepsi, man. You know, Coke needs Pepsi and Pepsi needs Coke. Two different companies, both selling the exact same product for the most part, you know, but they need each other. They need each other to, to keep go to the competition end of it. So not even the competition end, the, oh man, look what he just did. All right, I'm going to try to do that. Oh yeah, that's really fucking cool, man. Elliot's the man. I'm going to try to do that. You, Elliot, not me, Elliot, right? Like, you know, and, and it just, it, it, right, it raises, it raises the overall product. Mm-hmm. And that's for us at Easton, in the Easton Online, that's the point of it for us. Like, yeah, sure, we want to make a bottom line and that's, that's great and there's bills to pay and yada, yada, time and effort. But if all martial arts can come up because schools do it more skillfully, not the teaching of the martial arts, yeah, yeah, you'll do that just fine, right? But the building the culture, the, the onboarding of the members, the creating the community, then that will just be worth it, right? That, that will be worth it in and of, of itself if more people can have the life-changing experience of jiu-jitsu that I've had with, with martial arts and jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. 
hundred percent, you know, and if, if you know that what you teach is going to benefit your students, then, and I'm sure you, you have your own way of expressing this idea, then like anything that gets in the way of them signing up is like, if you don't do everything you can to help them sign up, maybe they never train and they end up in a self-defense situation and it doesn't go well, or they go to a school that's teaching nonsense or has a wrong environment that's dangerous and they end up getting hurt. It's like, that's real. Yeah, man. That's really why we started it because there's so many schools from our perspective, from my perspective, I'll just say, I won't put everyone in the, in the organization on it. Like they, they, they turn people off to jujitsu because they like, and I'm like, God damn it. Like, not that that person will even come to my school, but like that they, they think that jujitsu is bad. And I'm like, ah, oh, couldn't be more wrong. And yeah, that could have been the person that needed it most in the their most. life for whatever reason. Or it could have been like, can you imagine the shame if like Marcelo had gone into the academy and they were shitty to him right. and he never became what he was capable of being? Like the world would have lost. The world would have lost. Right. So, yeah. you know, we have a duty to not only the individual, but to the world to do our best to, you know, be our best, but then also give them the gift that we've been given through this, this wonderful art, these wonderful arts. Elliot, thanks, man. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Yeah, Thank man. You. Podcast number two, podcast number two with us. It was really great. Um, g- tell everyone where they can find sales jujitsu. Uh, so it's on Amazon, uh, okay. but if you go to salesjujitsubook.com as well, we have uh, uh, some free resources. We have a few free, uh, we have a free course um, and then we offer, and, and most of what we are focused on is not necessarily like jujitsu schools per se. It's more like elite kind of sales organizations, like okay. organizations. And so we, you know, it works for any environment, but we have a, a, a uh, an eight week course, a video course for sales teams, uh, that is like 197. So, you know, pretty easy. And, uh, you can find out about that at sales jujitsu book.com and, um, anything on me kind of outside of the jujitsu realm, it's Elliot by two L's, two T's. Uh, I missed eight. that one the first time. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I really appreciate you having me, man. Like I really admire what you're doing. Just positive energy thoughtful, you know, being a great example of someone who can, can be in both realms, can be a, you know, a serious, serious fighter, but be a man of character and a light to other people. So keep, keep up the great work and thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Thanks for the compliment and and same to you. You know, like our first conversation really got me thinking more and more, you know, um, it was part of the reason that, uh, the whole, teaching more females came up for me, you know, and, and, and I've really enjoyed that aspect. And, and that was, you know, not, not that I didn't teach females, but I didn't, I, I didn't have any like strong, I didn't, like this girl, Montana is the first female UFC fighter that I've ever had. And not that I was saying no before, but I definitely wasn't like uh, saying like running towards it and maybe some of my own shortcomings and insecurities and, and all of that, I'm sure someone's going to come and fucking hate on me for that. But, <laughs> um, but uh, how wrong I was, I will say, how, you know, how, how wrong I was. So you, you were helping part of that process, you know, of like, man, this dude only teaches girls. Holy shit. Fuck. Yeah. You know, so. Um, I appreciate, appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, man. So uh, as always, guys, you know, go check out Elliot. We here at Easton Online. We're always here for you. You know, there is uh, there's a link, you know, if you go to our website, there's a link where you can just get free 20 minutes with me. Uh, no, nothing. Just, you know, you get free 20 minutes. If you have some questions, if you have some concerns, anything in your school, uh, I will not try to sell you uh, the, the course. Like, you know where that is if you want it. Um, I'll gla- I mean, I'll gladly sell it to you if you want it, but that's not, that's not the point of the call. You have 20 minutes with me anytime, easton.online. And uh, yeah, thanks, Elliot. Go check out the book, Sales Jiu-Jitsu. And guys, go out there. Let's make martial arts amazing. Make your school as amazing as it should and deserves to be so that you can help as many people as possible.